everyone. Welcome to Topic 7, Part 2. We'll be covering on the legal profession, particularly on the role of barristers. Before I move on further with regards to the role of barristers, their qualifications and others, so let's check out this video, uh, a short clip video that I've prepared for all of you. So yes, today I'll be advising you on how you can be a barrister in the future. So let's start with the introduction. What is a barrister? So in UK, there is a split profession whereby a person with a law degree can actually decide to become a solicitor or a barrister. Barrister is actually a person who defends people or advocate on behalf of the member of the public who engage a barrister in the courtroom. So what do they do is because their qualification, they can represent the clients at the higher level of courts as compared to the solicitors. Solicitors will have the everyday dealings or everyday contact with the clients, whereas as opposed to barrister, they do not have a, a close relations or close contact with the clients. Their role is mostly to advocate in legal hearing. Uh, and as a barrister, they have a specialized knowledge on a specific area of law in order to provide advice and advocate before a panel of, of judges. So how can a barrister be employed? Because barristers do not have a close contact with the clients. Usually solicitors will provide brief or provide instructions to barrister. I have this client and I have this method. Can you represent this client in the courtroom? So that's how barristers are employed in the UK. With regards to the qualification, if you plan to become a barrister or not sure to become a, uh, a barrister, these are the uh, level of qualifications that you can consider. First stage is that, of course, you need uh, an undergraduate Bachelor of Law degree uh, at, with at least minimum of 2-2. Uh, after that, you can embark on the bar exam or known as the bar professional training course where you learn on the vocational stage. Uh, they will teach you about the legal research, writing skills, interpersonal skills, advocacy skills, and many more. And once you have completed the academic stage, the vocational stage, that's where you will embark on pupillage. Uh, pupillage is a one-year duration where you will spend uh, as a pupil in a barrister's chamber. So it will split into two parts. One part, the first six months, is where you shadow your barrister you follow your barrister wherever he goes, you observe how he deal with uh, the certain cases, how to write submissions and how to present before a judge. And then with uh, the second part, the other six months, this is where a pupil can take up on his or her own case and advise uh, on the matter, how to proceed with it, but on supervision of your master or the barrister himself. So how can you embark or how can you take on this journey on becoming a barrister? Once you've completed your law degree, that's where you can do your bar exam. In order for you to do the bar exam, you need to register yourself in either of the four inns. So you can choose one, either Gray's or Lincoln's or Middle Temple or Inner Temple. There are no differences between all of these four. So it's up to students' preferences. They can do their own research in terms of uh, if they have an idol or particular judge, so they want to follow the route taken by this judge, then they can choose the uh, one of the four ins that the judge have gone through. Otherwise, they can opt to go to any particular ins 
which is nearby to a place that already have uh, accommodation. For example, if a student decides to stay on at University of Leeds, so they can do the bar exam because they have an institution that do bar course in Leeds itself. So what is the purpose of uh, getting into all these ins? This is because you need to register yourself uh, in order for the ins to call students to the bar. So upon you've completed the bar course and passed the bar exam, then you need to attend a procedure where you get called to the bar itself. So what do they provide by enrolling into the bar? Uh, it's nothing to do with academic. Usually they'll get uh, students to attend workshops, to attend dinner, mingles with judges, mingles with uh, lawyers. Uh, so it provides a lot of opportunity to expose students with regards to the workings of the barrister itself. So you have qualifying units. Students need to fulfill at least 12 uh, by attending dining sessions or advocacy trainings. So with regards to the role of barrister, they are governed by the bar council. Same goes in any other countries. There will be a bar council that oversees uh, the practices and all the requirements of a barrister or of a lawyer. So the general council of bar council is equivalent for barristers as just like for solicitors. Uh, it is founded a long time ago, since 1894, and it's been set up to oversee the regulatory side of the bar council. You have the bar standard boards and also bar council. So the bar standard boards will oversee the bar council in order to ensure uh, everything has been run smoothly. So it's good that someone is overseeing someone so that there is no abuse of powers. So it, it involves separate membership. Um, so with regards to the changes of barristers code, education or training, it will be overseen by the bar standard spot. So any changes made at the bar standard spot level will affect the institution or university that provides higher education learning, especially those institutions that provide Bachelor of Laws program. And it will also affect uh, other universities that provide uh, articulation program to UK. So if it bar council, oh, sorry, bar standard boys, the bar standard uh, board made uh, changes in with regards to anything. So it will affect UK university, it will also affect Malaysian university. So with regards to the uh, barrister professional code of conduct, because you already have a bar council that set up uh, all its uh, regulations with regards to code of conduct for barristers. So if barristers uh, breach any of the code of conduct, uh, in actual fact, they, are, they do not have any immunity. Uh, so the purpose of having this professional code of conduct is so that barrister meets the need of the public and also to ensure proper administration of justice. Just because you represent a person uh, in courtroom and a person lost his or her own case just because you're not doing your job properly, so you can't say uh, you can't sue me. Because barristers are governed by the code of conduct. So there are certain ways how barristers need to deal with solicitors, with clients, with uh, the court itself, how to deal with confidentiality um, and other areas with respect to barristers' role. So if there's any complaint with regards to if a barrister mislead the court by hiding certain evidence or certain information, uh, failing to follow client's instruction or act dishonestly, then a disciplinary hearing can be conducted. So complaints can be made then uh, certain procedures will follow suit. So with regards to the liability of barristers, if a barrister is negligent with regard to his or her case, it can have a very serious impact on the clients. So this is a short clip video uh, that I've prepared for our students. <laughs>
So in the past, barristers are immune from being sued by their clients. So the case of Rhonda and Worsley, based on the video they have viewed, uh, sorry, viewed just now, uh, shows that uh, clients are taking an action against their barristers for not following proper instructions. Back then, in 1969, court held that barristers were immune from negligence because if uh, court were al to allow clients to sue barristers, this would open floodgates. Many people who are not happy with the court's decision can take an action to sue each and every barrister. So in order to prevent this from happening, court said no. But then, this position has changed. In 2002, in the case of Arthur J.S. Hall & Co., so as you can see, the claimant itself is a group of people suing a uh, barrister, uh, Mr. Simmons. So in this case, it was decided that the argument relied upon Rondells and Worsley, uh, whereby barristers are immune, are no longer immune in the case of Arthur J. S. Hall and Simmons. So moving forward, if barristers are negligent with respect to the cases that they have handled, so clients can take an action uh, in court and judges will hear those cases to determine whether or not Barrister has uh, been negligent in their cases. So these are the issues that you should consider with regards to the role of Barristers. So whether or not the split profession should merge into one. Barrister and solicitor should become one, just like in Malaysia. So in Malaysia, we have, once you have admitted to the bar, you an advocate and also a solicitor. So you have uh, two roles of just by emitting to one bar, being called once. Whereas in UK, if you decide to become a solicitor, you need to sit for a separate exam. If you want to become a barrister, you need to sit a separate exam. You also need to determine the advantages and disadvantages of uh, fusion with regards to combination of barrister and solicitor. So of course, there are good things if you combine it into one, but there's also disadvantages with regards to having a uh, fuse profession. These advantages would be as follows. You have fewer court specialists. So which means um, if a person is doing the role of solicitor and barrister, so you can't really focus on a specific area of law. So that could be a problem as well. Uh, the existing system by having dual profession is already okay. No one is complaining about it. So why not we just remain status quo? So the existing system is already established. Uh, reduce the overall quality of service with regards to the quality of service because you're a solicitor, you're a barrister, so sometimes you can't give your best in either or of the position. So with regards to the merger of the role, it can lead to creation of huge law firms, just like in any other countries, America, even in Malaysia. So you have big law firms whereby the lawyers can represent the client, give advice, or can go to court on behalf of the clients. But although with the existing disadvantages, so there are advantages of having fusion uh, in the profession. Uh, it will lead to less costs, you only pay a certain amount, uh, it's more efficient because as a solicitor, you're taking instruction from the client, you don't have to brief another person because you already know about the client's case. So it becomes more efficient. It removes the two tier ranking because some people look highly to the barristers, not so much to the solicitors so you remove all of this and it's more logical in sense of education so you just study for one exam after you pass the exam you both barrister and also a solicitor and the best part is clients will only deal with one lawyer so i've also prepared some activities so you can uh, try to attempt this activity after viewing this video. So this is one of them. And another activity is this one. So whereby uh, you need to put the steps in the correct category. And actually that's all. So I hope you enjoy the lesson on barrister and do consider the option of studying the bar in UK. Okay, thank you.